Saturday, 23rd of September, 10 a.m. Right. I'm going to reply to Mark Darcy's invitation and say quite clearly and firmly that I will be unable to attend. Oh, God, though. It is one of those mad invitations written in the third person. Seem to remember from childhood, I'm supposed to reply in same oblique style, as if I am imaginary person employed by self to reply to invitations from imaginary people employed by friends to issue invitations. What to put? Bridget Jones regrets that she will be unable... <sighs> Miss Bridget Jones is distraught that she will be unable... <sighs> Devastated does not do justice to the feelings of Miss Bridget Jones. Ooh, telephone. It was Dad. Bridget, my dear, you are coming to the horror event next Saturday, aren't you? The Darcy's Ruby wedding, you mean? What else? I was kind of hoping to get out of it. The line went quiet at the other end. Dad? There was a muffled sob. Dad was crying... I think Dad is having a nervous breakdown. What's wrong, Dad? It's... <laughs> he broke down again. It's the thought of her going with that greasy, be-perfumed bouffon wop and all my friends and colleagues of 40 years saying cheers to the pair of them and writing me off as history. They won't. Oh, yes, they will. I'm determined to go, Bridget. I'm going to get on my glad rags and hold my head up high and... <gasps> but... <gasps> Sobs again. What? I need some moral support. 11.30am. It is with great pleasure that Miss Bridget Jones accepts... Oh, for God's sake. Dear Mark, Thank you for your invitation to your ruby wedding party for Malcolm and Elaine. I would love to come. Yours, Bridget Jones. Tuesday, 26th of September. It is great when you start thinking about your career instead of worrying about trivial things, men and relationships. It's going really well on Good Afternoon. The really exciting news is that I'm going to be given a tryout in front of the camera. Richard Finch got this idea into his head at the end of last week that he wanted to do a live-action special with reporters attached to emergency services all over the capital. This morning when I arrived, he grabbed me by the shoulders, yelling, Bridget, we're on! Fire! I want you on camera! I'm thinking miniskirt! I'm thinking fireman's helmet! I'm thinking point in the hose! Anyway, it is all happening tomorrow and I have to report to Lewisham Fire Station at 11 o'clock. I'm going to ring round everybody tonight and tell them to watch. Wednesday, 27th of September, 9pm. Have never been so humiliated in my life. The idea was that when they cut to Lewisham, I was going to slide down the pole into shot and start interviewing a fireman. At five o'clock as we went on air, I was perched at the top of the pole ready to slide down on my cue. And suddenly, in my earpiece, I heard Richard shouting, Go, 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 go! So I let go of the pole and started to slide. Then he continued, Go, 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 Newcastle! Bridget, stand by in Lewisham! Coming to you in 30 seconds! I thought about dropping to the bottom of the pole and rushing back up the stairs, but I was only a few feet down, so I started to pull myself up again instead. Then suddenly there was a great bellow in my ear. Bridget, where on you? What the fuck are you doing? You are meant to be sliding down the pole, not climbing up it. Go, go, go! Hysterically, I grinned at the camera and dropped myself down, landing a schedule by the feet of the fireman I was supposed to interview. Lewis and we're out of time. Wind it up, wind it up, Bridget, yelled Richard in my ear. And now, back to the studio, I said. And that was it. Thursday, 28th of September, 11am. I'm in disgrace and I'm laughing stock. Richard Finch humiliated me in front of the whole meeting, flinging words like shambles, disgrace and bleeding bloody idiot.
at me randomly. And now back to the studio seems to have turned into a new catchphrase in the office. Patchouli came up and said, Oh, like, don't take any notice of Richard, right? He's, like, you know, really into control, right? That fireman's pal thing was really, like, subversive and brilliant, right? Anyway, like, now back to the studio, OK? October. Sunday, the 1st of October. 4am. Startling. One of the most startling evenings of life. After got depressed on Friday, Jude came round bringing with her a fantastic black dress for me to borrow for party. Had shock and arrival at the party, as Mark Darcy's house was huge, detached wedding cake style mansion on Holland Park Avenue, where Harold Pinter, they say, lives, surrounded by greenery. At the door we were greeted by serving staff who gave us champagne and relieved us of our gifts. I had brought Malcolm and Elaine a copy of Perry Como's love songs from the year they were married, plus a body shop terracotta essential oil burner as an extra present for Elaine, as she had been asking me about essential oils at the turkey curry buffet. Downstairs was one vast room, with a dark wood floor and a conservatory giving on to the garden. The whole room was lit by candles. Dad and I just stood and stared, completely speechless. There were large silver trays containing prawn wontons, tomato and mozzarella tartlets and chicken satay. It's a sensational party, said my father, helping himself to his 19th canopy. Mmm, I agree. I said through a mouthful of tartlet, as my champagne glass was filled as if from nowhere. It's bloody fantastic! Mum was now bearing down on us. What a lovely house! Haven't you got a nice stole to put over your shoulders, Bridget? Dandruff, trilled Mum, brushing Dad's back. Now, darling, why on earth aren't you talking to Mark? Um, well, I mumbled. What do you think, Pam? hissed Una tensely, nodding at the room. Showy, whispered Mum, exaggerating her lip movements like Les Dawson. Exactly what I said, mouthed Una triumphantly. I glanced around nervously and jumped in fright. There, looking at us, not three feet away, was Mark Darcy. He must have heard everything. Dinner was served in the drawing room on the ground floor and I found myself in the queue on the stairs directly behind Mark Darcy. Hi, I said, hoping to make amends for my mother's rudeness. It's a great party, I said. Thanks for inviting me. He stared at me for a moment. Oh, I didn't, he said. My mother invited you. Anyway, must see to the placement. Very much enjoyed your Lewisham Fire Station report, by the way and he turned and strode upstairs, dodging between the diners and excusing himself while I reeled. As he reached the top of the stairs, Natasha appeared in a stunning gold satin sheath, grabbing his arm possessively and, in her haste, tripping over one of the candles which spilt red wax on the bottom of her dress. Fuck, she said. Fuck! Funnily enough, the placement turned out to be rather brilliant. Mum was sitting next to neither Dad nor Julio, but Brian Enderby, who she always likes to flirt with. My dad was pink with pleasure at sitting next to a stunning Shakira Kane lookalike. I was really excited. Maybe I would be sandwiched between two of Mark Darcy's dishy friends, top barristers or Americans from Boston, perhaps. But as I looked for my name on the chart, a familiar voice piped up beside me. So, how's my little Bridget? Aren't I the lucky one? Look, you're right next to me. Una tells me you split up with your fella. I don't know. <laughs> when are we going to get you married off? Well, I hope when we do, I shall be the one to do the deed, said the voice on my other side. I could do with a new vimper. Mmm, apricot silk. Mark had thoughtfully put me between Geoffrey and the gay vicar. Actually, though... 
Once we all got a few drinks down, as conversation was by no means stilted. I was asking the vicar what he thought about the miracle of Indian statues of Ganesh, the elephant god taking in milk. The vicar said the word in ecclesiastical circles was that the miracle was due to the effect on terracotta of a hot summer followed by cold weather. As the meal broke up and people started to make their way downstairs for the dancing, I was thinking about what he said. Overcome with curiosity, I excused myself, discreetly taking a teaspoon and milk jug from the table, and nipped into the room where the presents had been unwrapped and put on display. It took me a while to locate the terracotta oil burner, as it had been shoved near the back, but when I did, I simply poured a little milk onto the teaspoon, tilted it, and held it against the edge of the hole where you put the candle in. I couldn't believe it! The essential oil burner was taking in milk! You could actually see the milk disappearing from the teaspoon! Oh my God, it's a miracle! I exclaimed. How was I to know that was when Mark Darcy would be bloody well walking past? What are you doing? he said, standing in the doorway. The essential oil burner I bought your mother is taking in milk, I muttered sulkily. Oh, don't be ridiculous, he said, laughing. I put some more milk on the teaspoon, tilted the spoon, and sure enough the oil burner slowly started to take it in. You see, I said proudly, it's a miracle. He was pretty impressed, I can tell you. You're right, he said softly. It is a miracle. Just then, Natasha appeared in the doorway. Oh, hi, she said, seeing me. Not in your bunny girl outfit today, then. <laughs> and then gave a little laugh to disguise the bitchy comment as an amusing joke. I paused to think up something very witty and cutting to say, but unfortunately couldn't think of anything. So after a bit of a stupid pause, I said, Nice to see you again. Bye. I decided I needed to go outside for a little fresh air and a fag. I stepped down into the sunken garden. They were playing Viennese waltzes in a rather smart, fanned a millennium sort of way. Then suddenly I heard a noise above. A figure was silhouetted against the French windows. It was a blonde adolescent, an attractive public schoolboy type. Hi, said the youth. He lit a cigarette and steadily and stared, heading down the stairs towards me. Don't suppose you fancy a dance? Oh, ah, oh, sorry, he said, holding out his hand as if he were at the Eton Open Day and he was a former Home Secretary who had forgotten his manners. Simon Dalrymple. Bridget Jones, I said, holding out my hand stiffly. Hi, ya, yeah, really nice to meet you. So can we have a dance, he said. I mean, out here? I hesitated. I was flattered to tell you the truth. What, with this and performing a miracle in front of Mark Darcy, it was all starting to go to my head. Please, pressed Simon. I've never danced with an older woman before. Oh, gosh, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean... He went on, seeing my face. I mean, someone who's left school, he said, seizing my hands passionately. Would you mind? Simon Dalrymple had obviously been taught ballroom dancing from birth, so it was rather nice being expertly guided to and fro. But the trouble was he seemed to have, well, not to put too fine a point on it, the most enormous erection I've ever had the good fortune to come across. And us dancing so close, it was not the sort of thing one could pass off as a pencil case. I'll take over now, Simon, said a voice. It was Mark Darcy. Come along, back inside. You should be in bed now. Simon looked completely crushed. He blushed scarlet and hurried back into the party. May I? said Mark, holding out his hands to me. No, I said, furious. What's the matter? That was a horrible thing to do to a young whippersnapper, throwing your weight about and humiliating him like that at a sensitive age. Then I noticed he looked rather agitated and hurt. 
I... He paused, then started pacing around the patio, sighing and running his hand through his hair. Have you read any good books lately? Unbelievable. Mark, I said, why don't you ask me something else? Ring the changes a bit. Ask me if I've got any hobbies or a view on the single European currency. I... He began again. Or if I had to sleep with Douglas Hurd, Michael Howard or Jim Davidson, which one I'd choose? Actually, no contest, Douglas Hurd. Douglas Hurd, said Mark. Mm, yes. So deliciously strict, but fair. Mm, yes, said Mark thoughtfully. You say that, but Michael Howard's got an extremely attractive and intelligent wife. He must have some sort of hidden charms. Like what do you mean? I said childishly, hoping he would say something about sex. Well, uh, he might be a good shag, I suppose, I supplied. Will you have dinner with me, Bridget? He said abruptly and rather crossly, as if he was going to sit me down at a table somewhere and tell me off. I stopped and stared at him. Has my mum put you up to this? I said suspiciously. No, I... Suddenly I realised what was going on. It's your mum, isn't it? Well, my mother has. I don't want to be asked out to dinner just because your mum wants you to. Anyway, what would we talk about? You'd just ask me if I've read any good books lately and then I'd have to make up some pathetic lie and... He stared at me in consternation. But Una Orkenbury told me you were a sort of literary whiz woman, completely obsessed with books. Did she? I said, rather pleased by the idea suddenly. What else did she tell you? Well, that you're a radical feminist and have an incredibly glamorous life. Ooh, I purred, with millions of men taking you out. <coughs> I heard about Daniel. I'm sorry. I suppose you did try to warn me, I muttered sulkily. What have you got against him anyway? He slept with my wife, he said, two weeks after our wedding. I stared at him aghast as a voice above us shouted, Marky! It was Natasha, silhouetted against the lights, peering down to see what was going on. Marky! she called again. Last Christmas, Mark went on hurriedly. I thought if my mother said the words Bridget Jones just once more, I would go to the Sunday people and accuse her of abusing me as a child with a bicycle pump. Then when I met you and I was wearing that ridiculous diamond pattern jumper that Una had bought me for Christmas. Oh, Bridget, all the other girls I know are so lacquered over. I don't know anyone else who would fasten a bunny tail to their pants or... Mark! yelled Natasha, heading down the stairs towards us. But you're going out with somebody, I said, rather pointing out the obvious. I'm not any more, actually, he said. Just dinner? Sometime? OK, I whispered. OK. Afterwards, I thought I'd better go home. What with Natasha watching my every move as if she were a crocodile and I was getting a bit near to her eggs. And me having given Mark Darcy my address and phone number and having fixed to see him next Tuesday. Tuesday, 3rd of October, 7.30pm, complete panic stations. Mark is coming round to pick me up in half an hour. 7.50pm, oh God, oh God, still have not washed hair. We'll quickly get into bath. 8 o'clock p.m. Drying hair now, very much hope Mark Darcy is late as do not want him to find me in dressing gown with wet hair. 8.05pm. Hair is more or less dry now. Then just have to do makeup, get dressed and put mess behind sofa. 8.15 p.m. Still not here. V good. Keen on a man who comes round late. In stark contrast to people who come round early. Startling and panicking one. And finding unsightly items still unhidden in the home. 8.30 p.m. This is weird. Does not seem like him to be more than half an hour late. 9pm. Cannot quite believe it. Mark Darcy has stood me up. Bastard. 
Thursday, 5th of October. 11am. In Lou's at work. Oh, no. Oh, no. On top of humiliating standing up debacle, found self-horrible centre of attention at morning meeting today. Right, Bridget, said Richard Finch. I'm going to give you another chance. The Isabella Rossellini trial. Verdict expected today. Get yourself down to the High Court. I want a hard-headed interview. Ask her if this means it's OK for us all to murder people every time we don't fancy having sex with them. What are you waiting for, Bridget? Off you go! I had no idea. Not even a glimmer of a clue as to what he was talking about. 11.05am. Thank God for patchouli. Bumped into her as came out of the toilets. Are you OK? She said. You look a bit freaked out. No, no, I'm fine, I said. Sure? She stared at me for a moment. Listen, right, you realise you didn't mean Isabella Rossellini at the meeting, don't you? He's thinking of Elena Rossini, right? Oh, thank God. God and all his angels in heaven above. Elena Rossini is the children's nanny accused of murdering her employer after he allegedly subjected her to repeated rape and effective house arrest for 18 months. 3pm. Was hanging around outside the High Court for ages with the camera crew and a whole gang of reporters all waiting for the trial to end. It was bloody good fun, actually. I even started to see the funny side of being stood up by Mr Perfect Pants Mark Darcy. Suddenly realised I'd run out of cigarettes. So I whispered to the cameraman if he thought it would be OK if I nipped to the shop for five minutes. And he said it would be fine, because you're always given warning when they're about to come out, and they'd come and get me if it was about to happen. When they heard I was going to the shop, a lot of reporters asked me if I'd bring them fags and sweets, and so it took quite a while working it all out. I was just standing in the shop trying to keep all the chains separate with the shopkeeper, when this bloke walked in, obviously in a real hurry, and said, Could you let me have a box of Quality Street? As if I wasn't there. Excuse me? Does the word Q mean anything to you? I said in a hoity-toity voice, turning round to look at him. I made a weird noise. It was Mark Darcy, all dressed up in his barrister outfit. He just stared at me in that way he has. Where in the name of arse were you last night? I said. I might ask the same question of you, he said icily. At that moment, the camera assistant burst into the shop. Bridget, he yelled, we missed the interview. Elena Rossini's come out and gone. Did you get my minstrels? Speechless, I grabbed the edge of the sweet counter for support. Missed it? I said as soon as I could steady my breathing. Missed it? Oh, God! I'll be sacked! Did the others get interviews? Actually, nobody got any interviews with her, said Mark Darcy. Didn't they? I said, looking up at him desperately. But how do you know? Because I was defending her, and I told her not to give any, he said casually. Look, she's out there in my car. I looked round and saw Elena Rossini in his car. So, where were you last night? asked Mark. Waiting for bloody you, I said between clenched teeth. What, at five past eight, when I rang on your doorbell twelve times? Yes, I was... I said, feeling the first twinges of realisation. Drying my hair. Pig dryer? he said. Yes, 1,600 volts, salon selectives, I said proudly. Why? <laughs> Maybe you should get a quieter hairdryer or begin your toilette a little earlier. Come on, he said, laughing. Get your cameraman ready. I'll see what I can do for you. 9pm. Cannot believe how marvellously everything has turned out. I've just played the good afternoon headlines back for the fifth time. Good afternoon, the only television programme to bring you an exclusive interview with Elena Rossini, just minutes after today's not guilty verdict. 
Our home news correspondent Bridget Jones brings you this exclusive report. Friday, 6th of October. Keep hoping Mark might ring me up and ask me for another date after the hairdryer debacle. Maybe I should write him a note to say thank you for the interview and sorry about the hairdryer. It's not because I fancy him or anything. Simple good manners demands it. Thursday, 12th of October. Hmm. <clears throat> Incensed by patronising article in the paper by smug married journalist. It was headlined, The Joy of Single Life. They're young, ambitious and rich, but their lives hide an aching loneliness. When they leave work, a gaping emotional hole opens up before them. Lonely, style-obsessed individuals seek consolation in comfort food of the kind their mother might have made. Ha! Huh. Bloody nerve! How does Mrs Smug, married at 22, think she knows? I'm going to write an article based on dozens of conversations with Smug Marrieds. When they leave work, they always burst into tears because, though exhausted, they have to peel potatoes and put all the washing in while they're Porky, bloat husbands, slump, burping in front of the football, demanding plates of chips. On other nights, they plop, wearing unstylish pinnies, into big black holes after their husbands have rung to say they are working late again, with the sound of creaking leatherware and sexy singletons tittering in the background. Sunday, 15th of October, 8.55pm. Just nipping out to get some fags prior to getting changed, ready for BBC Pride and Prejudice. Love the nation being so addicted. The basis of my own addiction, I know, is my simple human need for Darcy to get off with Elizabeth. Tuesday, 24th of October. On marvellous roll with work. Ever since Elena Rossini interview, seems can do no wrong. Come on! Come on! Rosemary West! Richard Finch was saying when I got into the office. Bit late, actually. Sort of thing that could happen to anyone. Holding up his fists like a boxer. I'm thinking lesbian rape victims. I'm thinking Jeanette Winterson. I'm thinking what lesbians actually do. Suddenly he was looking straight at me. Do you know? Everyone stared at me. Come on, Bridget, fucking late again. He shouted impatiently. What do lesbians actually do in bed? I took a deep breath. Actually, I think we should be doing the off-screen romance between Darcy and Elizabeth. He looked me up and down slowly. Brilliant, he said reverently. You, my darling, he said to one of my breasts, are an Absolute fucking genius! I've always hoped I would turn out to be a genius, but I never believed it would actually happen to me. Or my left breast. <laughs>